Hi there, everyone. My name is Max Young, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Roman's Bookstore to tonight's event. Tonight, we are lucky to have with us three different authors who will all be talking a little bit about their graphic novels and their life through graphic novels. Uh, again, we're so grateful that you could all make it tonight and that you're able to continue supporting our bookstore. Um, if you'd like to support us more in any way and the authors as well, you can go ahead and purchase their books from our store by clicking the green button down there that says you can purchase their graphic novels. Um, you can also go ahead and ask the authors questions tonight by clicking the ask a question button towards the bottom. And um, we'll go ahead and get to that at some point in the event. Um, but with all that out of the way, I'll go ahead and introduce the authors. Uh, so first off, we have Jeffrey Brown, who is the author illustrator of the New York Times bestselling Star Wars Jedi Academy series and the Darth Vader series. He is also the author of the Lucy and Andy Neanderthal graphic novels for middle graders and the picture book, My Teacher is a Robot. And he currently lives in Chicago. Um, also with him, Laura Netzer graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 2012. She has worked as a storyboard artist for Adventure Time and she currently lives in Seattle. And with them, Jose Pimienta was raised in Mexicali, Baja, California, and now resides in Los Angeles, where they work on comics and storyboards for animation and film. Suncatcher is their debut author illustrator graphic novel. And moderating, moderating this whole event tonight is Oliver Sava who is a Chicago-based freelance pop culture critic and journalist who covers comic books, television, and theater. So I'll go ahead and let them take control. Thanks, y'all. Hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to have you here tonight. And again, if you have any questions at any point, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll just be answering those throughout. Um, but yeah, I wanted to get started by, we've uh, been introduced to everybody but I would like to now hear about everybody's introduction to comics. Um, like, how did you discover the form and uh, what made you want to make your own comics? <laughs> and oh, yeah, yeah guess, anybody can jump in. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I started off with, with um, Two, the two kinds of comics that maybe most people are familiar with. So first was newspaper comics, and I would read the, especially the Sunday comics every week, but also like the daily strips. And my favorite was Garfield. I would actually cut out the Garfield strips and I pasted them in like a scrapbook and made my own Garfield collections. Um, and then the and then the other was uh, just regular superhero comic books. So I was always a into the Marvel comics, mostly X Men, and um, yeah, those those were the two main forms. And I like so growing up, I was just constantly drawing Garfield and constantly drawing Wolverine, basically. And um, yeah, and then it just grew from there over the years. Uh, okay, I'll go next. Um, I also loved newspaper comics as a kid and my parents had a collection of those old Harvey comics like Casper the Friendly mm. Ghost and Wendy the Good Witch um, and I really loved reading those. Those were a big deal to me. And then when I was in middle school the manga mm. boom happened and I read Cardcaptor Sakura by Clamp and I thought that was absolutely the greatest work of art that had ever been made and I wanted to live inside of it and that made me want to draw comics. Um, yeah, I, I'm very much similarly. Like I, uh, I grew up uh, reading newspaper comic strips and I don't know at what point I decided, I just kind of had to just like the thought of like, man, like, doing cartoons is the best thing ever. This is when I have the greatest time. And if, you know, if only drawing could be like the living, right? Um, but comics was never, it didn't seem like an option because my only exposure to comics at that point had been newspaper strips and they all just seem very quick. Like they all seem like, oh, you have to come up with gags or you only have four panels. Um, and then, yeah, same thing, like around middle school when I was exposed to the superhero stuff, um, this is not a diss, but like, I loved the format of like multiple pages and again, it's ongoing and these stories are bigger. Um, and, uh, but even though superheroes weren't really my thing, it just kind of seemed like, well, but this format is really cool. 
And then eventually I stumbled or somehow found comics that were more more on my tone, rather. Like when that's when I started bumping into like, yeah, like the Dan Klaus kind of stuff, or like, you know, things were more a slice of life, or things that, you know, like more quote unquote graphic novels, if you will. And that's when I was like, yeah, it's that. Like that's like I want to draw something like that, or that's the kind of stuff that I would like to do. Um, and in order in in terms of like what made me want to make my own comic, I think it was more like yeah, I, I think I was always, you know, interested in being the the storyteller, but I was just like looking for that format and once I found graphic novels as a thing, it's like, yeah, that's 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 where I wanna how do you do that? And um, it's been a journey ever since. And uh, Laura and Jose, I know you've worked in animation and Jeffrey, I don't know if you have much experience in other media, but what do you think makes comics different than um, these, and, and not just different, but special compared to film and or books or TV? Um, I'll go first. So I've, Pretty limited experience in animation. I've only worked as a storyboard artist and only remotely. I've never worked at a studio or house or for a show full time. Um, I would say the big difference is animation is almost impossible to make alone. You need a huge studio of people working with you. You need a uh, like TV network style money to fund an animation project. Whereas with comics, you can make it alone and you can make it on an extremely, or relative to other art projects, relatively small budget. So that kind of lends itself to like a DIY aspect um, that comics has that I'd say animation and TV tends not to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'll I'll second that. I mean, because because um, I think by the time that I was finishing my undergrad, uh, I ended up just like storyboarding a lot of student films, and that was a lot of fun because it was giving me the aspect that I also like, which is the social aspect in terms of like you know if you hang out with with, with filmmakers, like it's such a collaborative thing that you kind of have to get along with people or you have to be friendly and. You know, being on set was fun and all that. Um, but yeah, like once I started getting into storyboarding live action, it wasn't that difficult to, well, uh, to just attempt to get into animation. And my experience with animation is also very limited. Like it's <clears throat> it's predominantly from the freelance perspective. It's always been for uh, for either animated shorts or, uh, or for some like, you know, smaller freelance projects or stop motion for that matter. Um, very small studios and so on and so forth. But yeah, it's a, I think what makes it very different is that, I've, I think I've talked about this before, but like it's, I throw the analogy of like, you know how comedians that are actors also often go back to stand up because it's both so personal and it's just, it's just you and the microphone kind of a thing. I feel like comics are very much like that in terms of like the narrative of, sure, animation is, fun and cool and awesome and you know it's such a big thing but with comics there's also this opportunity that you know it, it can be just as impactful if it's one person making the whole thing as well as if it's a team making something significant and you know not to discredit any teams of writer artists or or all the people that take that it takes to put a graphic novel together or anything like that but uh in terms of the the writing slash illustrating there's opportunity to be more intimate and to be more personal that you don't get that with uh, with big with i don't want to say bigger but like with with art forms like film or animation because of the nature of it so yeah that's it yeah i mean i think you you stole two of the words that i was going to use is which is personal and <laughs> intimate like i mean i think um both in in the creation of comics and in terms of the consumption of of comics um in terms of creating it's 
especially with the kind of comics that the three of us are are doing where it's it's basically just one person um it's their vision and their like their story and so it's a it's a very like you like um intimate and personal way of like getting out your ideas and i think there's also something about comics that like in when you're reading a comic um where the drawing and the text and everything works together to be kind of like this very particular um voice that you're you're hearing and so when you're reading a comic you're like you're it's not like you can have two different prose authors who have very different writing styles but their their fonts are going to be like very similar but drawing styles are like if you look at the three of us our drawing styles are are so different from each other and so like you know and so you add that on as this other layer of of where you're really getting to see you know, like, like the real unique aspect of, of the author's voice. Yeah, I've written a lot about how the visual element brings a level of perspective that you don't get from reading prose. Uh, that's all created in your head. You're reading, when you read a comic, you're not just seeing the, the words and the voices that the, the, the writer wants you to have, but you're getting the, the whole visual element, which uh, makes it very, very expressive. It's, yeah, it's my favorite. So, um, this is, this is about family, fun, and friendship. So we're going to pivot a little bit away from comics. Um, and I just want to know what was your most fun experience as a child? <laughs> like mm. ever? Whew, ever. Like, or just like, it doesn't have to be the most, but like when you think about being, fun and having fun as a kid, what do you think about? I, I mean, for me, like, like the most, the fun was just, I would just, I was just constantly drawing. So I, my dad was a minister. And so I spent a lot of Sunday mornings in church and, um, but I would just draw the whole time. I would just like take out the Sunday bulletin and, and doodle all the time. And, and so that was fun. And, you know, I'd come home after school, I would, I would just draw while I was watching, you know, afternoon cartoons and, you know, in school, maybe not so much when I was a lot younger, but like definitely like through high school and college, I would, my notes are just basically just drawings with some text next to it. And um, yeah, so I don't know, drawing was always like, like the most f fun thing for me probably uh, You're next Laura <laughs> yeah I'm gonna say the most my most favorite thing to do as a kid was to um, play with my toys but I would be making up a story about them and when Oliver asked that question and I started thinking about it I was like oh that's embarrassing because <laughs> That's what I do now, <laughs> still, all the time. <laughs> it's just not with the physical toys, it's just with the characters in, in my brain. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite thing to do. Uh, my mom said that she would like walk past me playing and I would be talking out loud the whole time, like narrating the story. Um, <laughs> um, my... It's it's funny. Like my my first thought was because um, again, like childhood, I mean, that's it's an entire it's, it's years, right? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is kindergarten. Just meeting so many different kids, just like meeting so many different people in kindergarten, and just encountering just like people my height with. <laughs> Uh, with completely different <laughs> opinions. Um, but also, like, I think, like, towards more, like, later, like, it's like elementary school, middle school, like, it was definitely more the, uh, the, um, 
like watching stuff and like uh, just like going to movies or watching TV with friends or with just just consumption, just media consumption, I guess. It's like which is similar to what a lot of us are living now. Mm -hmm. um, reading what? Um, but yeah, just like it's. I think. Yeah, like I, I think I'm, I'm going to tie it to like the social aspect of being surrounded by friends that either share some perspectives, but not all of them, um, mm. and just learning from them, and also just running around and playing and just like being loud um, and stuff. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what I'll give it to. Cool. Let's jump into. To um, everyone's latest graphic novels, I would love to hear about the inspiration behind each of your books. Um, Jeffrey, I know they mentioned Lucy and Andy, but I'd like to hear about Once Upon a Space Time for that. Um, and just, yeah, where did the ideas come from? Why did you want to tell these stories? Um, yeah, so I guess I guess I'll start. So this is this is my new series, Space Time, and the first book, Once Upon a Space Time. And um, yeah, it's just after, so if you've seen the Lucy and Andy books, um, there, I did a ton of research for these and there's paleontologist characters that come in and explain the science of, of what we know at this point of how people lived in the stone age. And um, so I set up a bunch of rules for myself about being beholden to, um, trying to keep everything as accurate as possible and explaining when it wasn't accurate and why or why not. Um, and that was a lot of fun doing that series. And it was really interesting. It was like taking a whole paleoanthropology course for myself. Um, and so I was ready to do something really different. And so I've always loved science fiction and just getting to draw like a story with aliens and robots and exploring space. So it's the story of, of Petra and G-Day, they're two human kids that leave Earth and um, they meet some other kids who are all alien kids and get to um, take off on this journey to explore the galaxy together. So yeah, it was just, um, and there's still some science because I, I, I really like science and I like space science a lot, so, but, um, it's not always <laughs> nearly as accurate, um, but yeah, so it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, I, I've done a lot of Star Wars books and Star Wars is always, I guess, kind of the more the action side of science fiction. And then, but I always like Star Trek and other science fiction. And even now, like reading like the three body problem by uh, Xi Xin Liu, um, books like that, where it's more, heady sci-fi that's not necessarily as action. So I um, kind of try to tap into that side of things a little more. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll go Thanks next. <laughs> the, what was the question? What's the inspiration for the book? Um, that's a good question. So Bug Boys, my book is called Bug Boys. It's the first in a series. It's a collection of a series of mini comics I self-published over the past decade almost. Um, it was inspired by a lot of things. I started drawing these characters when I was watching a documentary about beetle collecting, bug collecting. Mm. And I was like, what if I could draw a beetle that instead of looking kind of freaky and like an alien, I could make it cute. And then when I started drawing those, I was like, okay, so these little cute guys, when they're talking to each other, what do they say? Where do they live? If there was to be a story about them, what would the story be? So I just started making those on my own and just kept doing it. Uh, so I kind of, let bug boys i try to let bug boys go where it wants to go um yeah um yeah it's, 
Get Bug Boys. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really good. It's a, uh, I, I loved it. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, so I wrote this book called Suncatcher, which is about a teenage. Uh, it's about a teenage guitarist who discovers that her grandfather's soul is trapped inside a guitar, and the only way to set him free is by playing the song that that he never got to write. Um, spoiler alert: This is not the guitar, um, but uh, but it's uh, but it's her other guitar. Um, so it sounds rather easy to say that like uh, the main inspiration for this book was um, I, a very like when I first started writing it like I just wanted to write a graphic I wanted to write a graphic novel about music because music was you know because music is like so important and so influential and I'm always listening to, to new stuff um, and but I didn't really know what the story was until eventually I started grabbing like a bunch of elements that that I just figured would be really cool. Um, and then eventually figured out a story. And, um, you know, I landed on some like particular motifs, like why, you know, like why her grandfather and not her parents, or like, wh like why, that, why that element, and like what's really the conflict there. So the th this is not a spoiler, um, but one of the things that I think w that made a lot of sense for me is like it's while her trying to solve her, you know, while well, her trying to play the song that her grandfather never got to write, and the reason why, you know, her grandfather was trapped in the guitar in the first place, um, this has driven her, this is driving her to be a little um, megalomaniac in the sense of like she wants to be in charge of making the music in her band, which is causing tension with her friends. Um, and I figure, like, yeah, that's that, that's something that a lot that, that that a lot of us deal with, where like it's we have something going on because we're not verbalizing it. It's causing us a little bit of conflict over there, um, and yeah, how to navigate that? Uh, and kind of like what I was talking about, like the whole I like making friends. Uh, yeah, like being in bands is a lot of fun, and it's all about the dynamic between each other. Uh, so that was like what I wanted to put into into a story. So yeah, like it's uh, that's that's what came out, and there's uh, there's some cool stuff in there. There's a lot of other guitars and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of live shows and uh, uh, other instruments. Uh, this was really just my excuse to draw electric guitars for over 200 pages. That's really why. That's the, that's really why. It's like acoustic guitars, electric guitars, basses, etc. I mean, with all three of these books, you do get a sense of it's you guys drawing the things you want to draw. Like I can feel as a reader that like Jeffrey, you like drawing kind of old schooly sci-fi stuff. Uh, Laura, you're very into nature. Jose, the equipment, all the music stuff. Um, we actually got some questions from Avery Kaplan in the chat. Um, and it, there's one for each of you. So I will start with Laura. Uh, will we see the spider hey. librarian in Bug Boys, Volume 2? Spoiler alert? Yes. No, it's not really a spoiler. She shows up <laughs> a lot. Um, yeah, another character I invented on a whim, um, a friend of mine was like, you should make a Bug Boys issue where they meet a spider. And I was like, done. So then I've got to invent like, oh, well, who's the spider? What do they do? Where do they live? Um, but yeah, she shows up a lot because she's, she's an adult character and the hmm. Bug Boys have a lot of questions and have a lot of questions. And she is the librarian. So she has access to the answers to their questions. Um, Anyway, yes, I love her. She's mean. <laughs> <laughs> She's a very fun visual. I like I like how you draw her for sure. Like you can Thank be you. very expressive. Yes, absolutely. You can tell I was the kid who had a crush on the spider in Jameson's Giant Peach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jose, was it important that Suncatcher be set in Southern California? Yes. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so the story takes place, uh, not to sound like I'm correcting, but like uh, the story takes place in my hometown of Mexicali, Mexico, which is a city that is in the border with California. Uh, the, the neighboring city is a city called Calexico. 
And for those of you, but yes, they are. Um, these are twin cities that were you know, founded at the same time. Um, Mexicali, Cali, you know, Calexico, you get it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was very important for me to, to set the story there precisely because um, when I was growing up, uh, this is in the early 2000s, late 90s, internet access wasn't really that much of a thing. Uh, the, uh, the access to music was very particular, you know, like it's, uh, and being in that region, we had access to radio stations. We had access to American radio stations. So immediately we were catching on what was being influential in Southern California, as opposed to other parts of Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. Write what you know, and I know about Mexicali, so that's why I said it there. But yeah, like it's a, I wanted to capture that particular place uh, because I love it. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I've heard from other people that the story speaks to them as well, and people that have either never been to Southern California or <clears throat> until they read my book had never heard of Mexicali, and that's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, like to me, it was important to, to set the location uh, somewhere where I knew what, what that place would look like. So. Oh, that was Jeffrey. And uh, Je Jeffrey, do you have a favorite museum? I, I, yeah, I love like lots of museums. So, I mean, the Field Museum here in Chicago is probably near the top. Um, and Chicago also has the Adler Planetarium and the Museum of Science and Industry and this Art Institute. Um, can't, haven't really gone to any museums in a while, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, like it's funny because when I was a kid, my parents, like we'd go on vacation, we'd visit museums all over and I did not appreciate it. And now I'm like, oh, <laughs> need to go back out, like go back to all these museums. But yeah, I mean, it's like now it's it's like I go visit other cities and I'm like, um, if I have time, I like to go see, see museums, like go stop at the Natural History Museum in New York or, if I ever get back to DC and visit the Smithsonian or something. Hmm. Uh, we have another question from Mary. What advice do you have for someone who likes drawing comics? Just one, just one, just, just, just one advice. <laughs> the biggest, let's do one big piece of advice from everybody. Um, who wants to go first? I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, my, my big piece of advice with comics is, is um, to not worry so much about how it's going to turn out. And, and that's advice really that you can extrapolate to any kind of art. But um, the important thing is just to, to get to the business of making, making it. So if you like drawing comics, just go draw some comics. Um, if you get too wrapped up and worrying about what it's going to turn out like, or or for like for people like us who have published books, like it's it's easy to like get caught up in thinking about the next project and what it'll be like when it's published, and you lose track of like the reason we all draw comics is it's like it's actually fun and interesting to draw comics, and if you focus if you keep your focus on that aspect, um, and and you just keep practicing. The, the rest of it will fall in line and you can worry about that later. But so, yeah, so, so um, just, just get to it and have fun. Uh, my advice for the actual drawing of the comic is put all the words on the page first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pencil those in first and then draw in the space that you have left over. Don't try to fit the words into the space that's left over after you draw. And then my broader advice for making comics is make friends who also like to do so, or who at least like to read comics. Just a friend you can discuss it with, show it to. It can be an online friend if you don't have anyone near you that does so. And yeah, just keep doing it. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. Uh, <laughs> both, both of those answers are really good. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it's, I guess, yeah, like, 
have fun with them, keep making them. Um, you know, like, I think that I would also just throw in, um, depending on the kinds of, like, be open, like, be, be, be as open as possible, because, I mean, uh, I am a big fan of the of the idea that we are what we consume. So if you want to make comics, then just consume more comics and read more comics. So that way you can find the kind of comics that you either like to make or like to read and figure out how that works for, for you particularly. Um, so, but also like be open to reading comics that you have never heard of, but also be open to reading comics from creators that maybe you don't relate or maybe to have not aligned or haven't thought about it um because you never really know like what you'll end up uh, associating or what, what you'll end up relating to as a surprise so yeah be open keep making them and yeah uh, so that's it's very hard to follow the, the have fun and uh, put all the letters of lettering first. So like it's a <laughs> but uh, I'll uh, I'll stick to that. Is there is there one thing that you guys really don't like drawing? Like I know some artists don't like drawing cars. Some don't like. I mean, I feel like horses are like a notoriously just like hard thing for people to draw. Is there anything that like makes you crazy? You're right around it. <laughs> Guitars. <laughs> yeah, I, I was shocked when Zay said that he likes drawing instruments. Instruments uh, are so hard. They're, they're so great. Uh, yeah. I take that personal. Uh, no. <laughs> No, it's, I think it's a compliment. No, it's I mean, a compliment. No, like, it's, like, it's like, like, ama like oh, it's amazing. He likes them so much. Yeah. He, can, he did it. He learned how to do it. The rest <laughs> of us didn't. 200 pages of it. Um, uh, uh, guitarist is more like it. No, like it's a, uh, from, uh, with Suncatcher, I discovered a few things that I do not, that I did, that I had a had difficulty drawing. And that is recording consoles, like things that are just like so. <laughs> big and repetitive like that that, that kind of drove me that that kind of scared me because it's just like it's and for anyone who has ever seen a recording console it's all just a bunch of buttons all over the place but they are but, but they are so symmetric that if you're trying to draw them accurate then it's just um right now i'm discovering that i'm not a big fan of um because cars i love drawing um so yeah no like it's a i'm, I'm trying to think like it's a what like what, what don't i like drawing like what gives me a really hard time um i'm gonna go with this escalators escalators <laughs> escalators are a challenge um yeah yeah i'll i'll, I'll go with that um flora what about you <laughs> Uh, I was gonna say cars. Um, yeah. I recently got around it by having the extreme genius brainwave of setting my comics in the future, so I can make up like a hover car. That's like a new thing, so people won't know that I'm drawing it wrong because it's not based <laughs> on a real thing. Um, yeah. Kind of blobby thing with some ridges. Yeah, on it's, the bottom. Oh, it's just a blob. There's a door, um, vaguely car shaped, kind of a jelly bean. Uh, I, 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 I have a friend who uh, who draws this amazing uh, series called uh, the, the City Between, and she draws like all these, you know, really really fun stories. Anyways, uh, in her world, uh, everyone moves through public transportation, and horses have gotten extinct. Precisely for the reason of like she didn't want to draw cars and she didn't want to draw horses, <laughs> so that's that's a solution. Like it's a yeah, so it's ingenuity a, right there. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> at the at the end of Bug Boys, you have a little section on how to draw the two lead characters, and I'm very um, like curious about how much you're thinking about when, especially when you're doing comics for younger readers. So I guess this is more of a Laura and Jeffrey question, but how much can your art style be replicated by the people that are reading it? And 
how much do you think the appeal in comics is for that age range in it being something that they can then grab a piece of paper and draw that thing that they see on the page? Uh, that's interesting. When I, when I was designing the Bug Boys, I wasn't thinking of ease of replication by someone else. I was thinking of making them distinctive, both distinctive from each other and just distinctive from other cartoon characters. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was more interested in like designing the parts of their body so it was clear what directions they were facing. Like they have like lines on their arms and that helps me show like what direction their arm is moving in. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't consider someone else drawing them when I started. I was just thinking yeah. of something that would be fun and interesting and distinctive. Yeah, I, for the most part, I, I don't really think about that um, consciously, but maybe subconsciously, except for in, in the, my new series, I like the robots. So there's, mm -hmm. these are called elements, elementes are the robots and there's 119 of them and they each have a letter, which um, kind of, so this is K, the robot K or Pablo, his is PB. Um, but I figured like, like I'll never show all of them in the books. And so I figured that like, it's a kind of a simple design that kids mm. would be able to like take their their own take on um, the element design, the standard template or whatever. And um, so I actually did have that in mind that kids could like, like come up with their own robots that would be on the spaceship that we never see in the book. Um, but yeah, normally I don't. I don't think about anyone else. <laughs> Just <laughs> selfishly, yeah. selfishly about me. I find it interesting how like younger reader graphic novels and comics will be a lot more interactive. Like even uh, Once Upon a St Space Time opens with kind of that hologram, like it's a holograph reader or whatever. Um, yeah. Which is just like a fun way to play with the form and make it feel a little bit more interactive. Um, and I'm also thinking of uh, like Chad Sell's book, uh, Doodleville and Cardboard Kingdom, where you can kids can go make cardboard outfits for themselves, or it's a book that's about doodling. Um, and yeah, I find that all just pretty interesting in terms of because because these are like graphic novels for kids and uh, like younger readers are experiencing such a moment right now. And I'm just always curious about what are the things that are making this form so appealing to that generation. Um, and I mean, I guess that's a question I would like to pose to all of you guys. I feel like you've all come into comics from very different directions. Um, why do you think that this is such a big moment for graphic novels and kind of specifically in that like five to 16 age range? pretty young and then also up through teenagers. I mean, I guess we have this conception in the United States that comics are children's entertainment. Whereas, you know, really, if you think about it, a comic can be about anything. So it can be for anyone. Um, I think I th guess I just think that publishers are kind of they feel like it's kind of safe to be promoting a big comic boom for kids and teens because that uh, that land has already been tread by manga, mm -hmm. like the the manga boom in the early two thousands was like a huge thing for getting teens into reading comics. When, whereas before maybe comics they thought of them as being for babies. Um, yeah, I saw people talking about this on Twitter the other day about like why aren't there more graphic novels for adults yeah. having this kind of <laughs> resurgence. Um, I think it's because people 
like conceive of comics as being for younger in like the broad right uh, broad <laughs> yeah. sense not not us because we're like in it um, <laughs> so yeah in our very youth right now yeah uh, uh, what are you what do you guys think i mean like so i feel like like when i was a kid comics were on this kind of upswing where like there was like this whole comics aren't just for kids anymore and it was like watchmen dark knight mouse um and then he started to have like like dan Klaus and julie Dusay and some of the, the kind of the indie comic art tours um but then um i like so i i feel like the the, the big thing now is is like there's comics for more and more comics being made for younger readers that weren't like, like there was never a book like Suncatcher when I was the age where I would have read Suncatcher. There was never a book like Bug Boys when I read, when I would have read Bug Boys. Like I had X-Men and Garfield, like, <laughs> right. Right. you know, it was like, and then, um, and so, like I feel like it's easier now to find like whatever reading level you're at, whatever age you're at, and what your interests are. It's easier to find um, a book that that matches like those those criteria. And um, so I think that's the the biggest thing that I see is like it just more and more being made and more and more good stuff like being made. Like like um, I mean. Like I, I read with my kids and um, like, it's great because I'm, I get to read stuff that like, I, there's very little that I end up reading that I'm like, ugh, I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why they like this so much. It's not very good. Like, like most of what they're reading is like, oh yeah, I, I actually don't mind having to read this with them, so. Yeah, like I was, uh, I, I was gonna follow up like at, um... I think a lot of it also just comes from also the uh, the development the, the developments that have happened in education. Where like uh, you know just kind of following up in what the, in what everyone is saying that I that I agree with. Where like it's for so long there used to be this mentality that like comics are not to be taken serious. They're just this thing that it's in the paper and it's just this thing for people that don't want to read real books and all this nonsense. Um, but I do think that like. It has been a long time coming, and it has, and it has been a long time building on, um, predominantly from librarians and educators that were starting to bring graphic novels or comics, for that matter, as another method of teaching or as another method of instructing. And I think that a lot of them started seeing the, uh, you know, started seeing the resonance that um, different, pe like kids in this case, were responding to the visual indications to, you know, and to, and. <clears throat> and how that was helping them learn better, or how was that, that helping some people learn? Um, and in this case, like I'll insert myself a little bit into this narrative. Like it's, I do remember as a young, as, as a kid, predominantly in middle school, just thinking that I didn't like reading because I would be handed these prose books that I'm sure are great, but like I couldn't get into them because it was just this wall of gray stuff. I was like, I'm, I can't look at that. But like, as soon as I started getting into comics and graphic novels, it's like, give me those 300 page books, 500 page books, like, I'll take them all in. Um, and I think that there's been like a lot of development on that, that like, uh, for the past few years with some books like, you know, with, with, with I think like some of the bigger players in this case would, like, would be like the Raina books that like suddenly that started speaking to an entire branch and now we're finding out like how there's different books that are also speaking to a whole different uh, to a whole different demographic and we're just kind of learning that there are other ways to approach a story or there's other ways to read stories um which is all for the better <laughs> you know so it's, uh, i i think that that has been like a huge contributor is that um uh, kids can look at a book and not and, and not look and, and kind of go with the gimmick of oh it has pictures it's more accessible you know like it's uh, and I'm a huge wa uh, waving waver of the flag that 
comics or literature, but for a while it used to not be taken like that. It used to be like the older you get, the less pictures there are in your books, yeah. and that's how you mm -hmm. and that's how you know that you're reading a serious book. Like nothing's more serious than than a, <laughs> a thousand page pictures. book. Yeah, like it's. <laughs> you know, and now we're kind of like you know, thanks to so many like so many people that have been working on this for years. Like there's like no, that's that's a fallacy. Like that's that was wrong. <laughs> like it's. Um, there's other ways to to learn, and there's other ways to appreciate literature, and it just so happens that if we can start all the way from infancy with pictures, and it's fine, and it's great. It's getting people to read. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So yeah, let me just get down from my soapbox for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. No, we've got a couple of uh, questions from Irene. Uh, first, what is more important to you, style or idea? So I guess the visual style or your concept for what the story um, is going to be. I mean, I, I don't think you can really separate the two. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> so, like, like my comics tend to be like pretty humorous and so the style is like it's not super realistic it's you know um you know the arms are bendy and not necessarily anatomically accurate and um but that allows for a lot of humor and ex expressiveness and emotion and um so i like so the style follows the idea that um you know that i yeah you can't really separate that out for me. Yeah, I would say one definitely informs the other. Um, I try not to commit to making comics in a drawing style or rendering style that doesn't come naturally to me and just for the sake of how much labor I would have to sink into <laughs> developing an entirely new way to draw. Um, but, you know, you make choices for paneling or rendering to a certain extent based on the tone and idea and concept of the comic. Uh, if I really had to no, they can't be separated. <laughs> I was trying to separate them and I was like, no. Yeah, like it's a, I, I mean, yeah, like it's exactly. A, uh, I do think like if you really want to make a distinct definition for for both of them, I guess ideas are a great starting point, and I think that it's good to just like refer to them as like your your structure, I guess, like your like like your solid bones, if you will. Like if you have a good idea, that means like okay, you, you, you. but a style is usually gonna either follow from that or you're going to develop from that. Like it's. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just like thinking of from a, from a personal stance, like it's, um, I remember like the, there's been times where I'm like I've tried to draw in a different way, and eventually it's, eventually it starts wearing me down because it's like oh I'm just trying a little too hard to draw something that it's that that is not really what I'm accustomed to or that it's just as Laura said like it's just way more effortful and like and then bringing it back to what we were saying earlier, that's when it starts getting not so fun. And if I'm not having fun, mm -hmm. well, then why am I, why am I even in this room by myself uh, talking to cats? Uh, but no, like it's a, style is great, but it also, it takes a very long, it, it takes a very long time and a lot of practice to develop a style or to like exercise that style and to solidify one. But ideas can come from anywhere and ideas are, are great, like are great if you can just, continue to have them or continue to nourish them as you develop your story. So, yeah, no, it's, I'll side with, 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 yeah, you can't separate it. Like, it's kind of like, it's, it's, please have both. Uh, uh, it's good, it's important to have both. Um, yeah. And then uh, we have one more question from Irene about kind of process. Um, she asked, do you write a script or make up the drawing as you go? So uh, I guess how, how much scripting are you guys doing for your books? Um, is there any sort of spontaneous creation? Do, do things change once you start putting it on the page? Um, 
I've, well, I've got props, so I'll, I'll show you guys. So, yeah, so I, I start out making extensive scripts. So this is like a page by page script and I rewrite the script um, multiple times. Um, I don't know. So, so each book like will have, like have a, an out, it starts as just like kind of a basic outline and then just gets more and more detailed. Then I do the first draft, which is like stick figures. So nice. sometimes I have to write letters to, to so that my editor knows which characters are are which in that version. Um, then, then I do a third draft. Where did the third draft or second draft, um, second rough draft, which is a little more more detailed, um, but still pretty rough. And then okay, okay. these these are um, just drawn on this really thin moleskin sketchbook paper. And then I use a light box and then do the final artwork on illustration board. So um, so and so uh, there's two sides to it. One is that I like to over plan so that I don't end mm -hmm. up spending a lot of time drawing something for a story that doesn't make sense and I have to go back and fix because even even times I've had times when the second rough draft where I've had to like go and fix a bunch of problems with the story that like made sense to me when I was writing it and then my editor's like I'm so confused I don't I don't why is this character here and I'm like <laughs> oh yeah it doesn't kind of make doesn't make sense um, but I do still try to leave room for for surprises and changes too so. Um, there'll be little jokes and things that'll get added at the last minute, or sometimes I'll, I'll have kind of rough text that's just in place. Um, and I know that I'm going to come up with something better by the end, but I just leave it instead of, you know, trying to figure it out at whatever stage, just, I just leave it until it comes more naturally so that I'm not banging my head against the wall, trying to come up with um, just the right words at that time. But yeah, it's um, for me. It's you know, I try to have everything pretty well planned out so that um, I don't spend a bunch of time having to redraw stuff later. Okay, I'll go next. Um, I'm at my desk, so I can also use a prop. So I don't write a script per se with like dialogue and scene direction and all that. I'll try to write like a paragraph or even just a list of bullet points of what happens in the plot. Um, and then I try to start thumbnailing it as soon as I can because it just makes sense to me to start making it a comic as fast as I can. So here's, this is just like a cheap sketchbook from the supermarket. Um, so this is like an example of me writing out all the plot points. And then I start thumbnailing it. It's kind of like, you know, you can see like there's Rhino B and there's Stag B. So they're basically stick figures at this point. Um, and this, this stage is when I'm like doing the most thinking because I'm paneling out what is important in the story, what's important in the tone to get the scenery across. I try to allocate the most space on the page to beats and dialogue pieces that are the most important. Like they get the most physical space. Um, if I were just making this a mini comic on my own, I would take this and just immediately start penciling. Um, since I'm making this book with an editor, this time I have redrawn this page in Clip Studio Paint, which is like a, a image making software, very similar to Photoshop, but it has like special features for making comics. So I've redrawn these slightly cleaner with all the words in a font and I've sent that to my editor. And then I hope, hopefully, we'll do all the editing <laughs> at, at that stage, the still very drawn, very rough stage, and then take that to pencils and inks later on. So to answer the question, I 
I don't write a script, but I write what happens. Yeah. I need to know what happens. I don't need to know exactly how we get there, mm -hmm. but I figure that out when I'm thumbnailing. Yeah. OK, good question. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, very similar to both. Like, it's a. Uh, um... Uh, I I do write a script, but I mean, like, it's a very loose script. Like, the only thing that I kind of put more in like the formal setting is the dialogue, uh, you know. But I uh, I I start by writing just like an outline, and then I start developing an outline into something that is more page breakdowns. And on the page breakdown, really, I just need to know what is happening and who's saying what, um, and then I'll go to thumbnail. I, I left my prop up in the other. So like, but it looks very similar to the other two. I assure you, like it's a, uh, and it's also just squiggles. So like it's, uh, but uh, but yeah, and m very much like Laura said, like that's the time where it's like it's, it just feels very difficult because you're trying to like literally translate something textual into something visual, and you spend so much time on like how do I make this as visually as interesting as possible, uh, what you know composition and all that. Um, but yeah, like it's um, I do the thumbnailing, and then once I do the thumbnailing, then I move directly to penciling on Bristol board, and then on Bristol board, I ink directly on top of the pencils. Mm. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I definitely try to have as much, uh, the big thing that I learned uh, it's a, at some point is like, it's a, the smaller the problems are easy, the easier they are to solve. So if I'm already planning on writing, on working on a long book, uh, it's easier to solve the problems, the, the story problems, when they're just words. Just fix this. Oh, and, and as opposed to I've drawn forty pages already. What do you mean he can't be that tall? Uh, like, mm. what, what, what do you mean you want this scene on a train instead of you know a bridge? Um, so that's just easier for me. Um, so yeah, I do think that it's. Uh, I do try to script as much as possible um, without getting too formal, but also knowing that. I'm going to change some things at some point. Like I may add pages, I may switch the dialogue. Like it's, a, I may change a, a setting or something, and it's fine. Like that, that has happened a couple of times. But like, oh, instead of them talking about this in the living room that I've drawn like 40 times already, I'll have this dialogue in the backyard. So like, let's draw some trees today. Draw, instead of drawing furniture, I'm going to draw trees. Like that's. That's the, that. That'll be the, and that's the big change. But the dialogue is the same, and still the same characters. And the story doesn't change. It's just like little things like that. So, uh, yeah, drawing as you go along sounds wild. Uh, go Mavericks! Uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, that's it. hooray for improv. I guess. Cool. Yeah. I think we are. At, at time so um awesome i mean this is really fun guys yeah a great time. Yeah. thanks for all your questions everyone yeah, um again you. there's a button at the bottom roman's is going to tell you everything you need to do awesome yeah thank you so much to maura jose and jeffrey you were all awesome um and thank you again oliver for moderating incredible round of applause to all of you um again you can go ahead and purchase there graphic novels by clicking the green button down below. Um, thank you to everyone in the audience for tuning in and listening to them. That was a really fun, exciting talk. Um, and again, thank you all so much for joining us and talking tonight. It was a really good event. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. Have a good yeah. one. Thank you. Good yeah. evening. This was awesome.